Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz drummer Edmund Catlin of the Minneapolis-based jazz band Hoaxer. He's based out of Montreal these days going to school, but the band is collectively out of Minneapolis-St. Paul. He talked about the band's evolution, their new album Crash Test, and so much more. So please get to know him, the band, and dig this interview, my friends. Thank you again for taking some time out to talk to me about the album and to talk about the band and, and your life in music. Oh, I'm so glad to. Thanks for having me. Sure. So let me go ahead and start off here and ask, how is Minneapolis these days? <laughs> how is Minneapolis these days? Um, you know, honestly, I might not be the most qualified because I'm in Montreal for school. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Um, that said, um, the scene in Minneapolis is uh, it's fantastic. Um, I, I spend my summers and my winter breaks there, and literally every night there's too many people to go see. It corners, honestly, the scene is doing so well in Minneapolis that you feel cornered a lot. You have to pick between four people between whom picking is somewhat criminal, you know? So it's going great. Very cool. I'm going to go ahead and let's dive in to your latest 2017 album. Talk to me about this yeah. album. It's a great listen. I really dug it. I want to know what you think. This album, or at the very least the name and the intention behind the producers and um, the guy who bankrolled it, um, was to capture what they felt was a pretty big moment that that had come together without any real planning or, or or just a sense of what was yet to come. Um, we One of our, our bassists was offered a gig in the backyard of a, uh, a great musician who lives in the Twin Cities named uh, Chris Cunningham. We just got together and figured a few tunes out and played, and people really liked it, and we had a really good time, and we thought, oh, heck, we'll keep doing it. Um, next thing we know, we've packed the Black Dog, and Steve Kenny, the guy who produces the album, comes up to us and says, there's a guy who wants to make an album, and... Um, we're going to do it. So it, the whole thing was kind of designed to reflect that, <laughs> you know, our, so to speak, we might have kind of been in over our heads and we were doing a crash test and um, just seeing what the heck happens, you know? It just seems like some of the songs on the album are politically charged and the, I really enjoyed mm. fake news. I, fake news I put on my show last week and that obviously has to have something to do with the hearkening to the modern day political realm that we're dealing with in America. You know, it's funny, um, <laughs> that, that title, we do have some songs that are somewhat charged. One of the tunes I wrote, I joke was written by, um, Donald Rumsfeld. When we, when we play it live, I say, this is a tune written by Donald Rumsfeld and hoaxers intelligence department found it digging through WikiLeaks emails. Um, but no, it's funny. It's funny that you you you, you mentioned that because um, fake news was it didn't really have anything to do with the song. We just didn't have a title yet, and this was December, so the word was really reverberating in everybody's um, in everybody's skulls. So it just kind of came out. <laughs> cool. But yeah, Beautiful. I think we have our inclinations. Yeah. <laughs> right on. How did you guys all come together? How did this band kind of form? I know that you went to St. Paul Central High School and now McGill mm -hmm. in Montreal. So give me an idea of how you guys all came together. Well, really, I think we had all kind of been incubated in the um, in the jazz education <laughs> industrial complex that um, that the Twin Cities has, has uh, done such a good job of building up. I mean, I think three of us were in the Dakota Combo. Four of us have done Minnesota Youth Jazz Bands. Three or four of us have done... All state. We all are public school kids. We all grew up in band programs, and um, you know these really kind of adult supervised institutional uh, musical settings. And so we just got to know each other. I've known I've known of Will Keir since I was probably 14 years old. So there, you know, there's it's a pretty tight scene. I mean, we all, you know, a lot of the people in the or a lot of the the cast I play with have like a Facebook chat devoted to the twins. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's pretty tight. And, uh, yeah, we all, we all knew of each other from that. And, um, it did a great job of, uh, giving us a space to check each other and ourselves out. 
what would you say are some of the biggest mu- musical influences for you guys as a band? That's an interesting question. Uh, Honestly, I think we all have fairly disparate tastes. We all bring very different things. I mean, I have a propensity to bring in tunes that amount to country music. Will Keir has a... He, he brings in really well, thoroughly composed um, modern jazz pieces. Charlie brings in stuff that um, seems to be inspired a lot by Paul Motion. We're, we're kind of all over the place, and I think the... Um, Truly, one of my favorite things about Hoaxer is that I just never know what they're going to think about an idea. Um, I never know what they're going to bring in. And I think we've created a really good, um, <laughs> if you will, I might even kind of compare Hoaxer to a, a fungus of some sort, where we take all this music and leave it out and <laughs> and we grow on it. But with that said, our Facebook uh, page defines us as loud jazz. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think we try to reflect the intensity and um, kind of piercing nature that m- modern life has. <laughs> so let me ask you this. We kind of talked a little bit at the top of the uh, of, of the interview, and I think it's something that I've I try to probe into a little bit. What is the health of jazz in America and Montreal? in 2017? seems to me that's a question that could be answered in many ways and they would all be right. But I will say this. Um, I think people are burnt out on mediocre art. I think there's a lot of it. Um, and I think people are realizing that um, beneath the arena of mainstream music and mainstream success, there have been countless people who are working their hardest and pouring pouring their souls into this music, into themselves, into human expression. Um, so in that sense, I think jazz is doing as well as it's ever been doing. People care. People want to have lots of things to say. Um, and honestly, I think it's, it's market success. As a, it's a bit of a clumsy metric, but I think it's market success is saying a lot, too. Um, I mean, it's entering pretty profoundly the the hip hop world. Um, it's, I mean, some of the best pop and country musicians in the Twin Cities are are jazz musicians fundamentally. Um, so honestly, I think it's doing pretty well. Um, I think, yeah, I think people are excited. I think people want to hear good music. I think people have been working on making good music, um, and I think there's an imperative for us to express ourselves. Um, more so now than uh, maybe ever. So honestly, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, whether or not I'll have a solid six-figure income when I'm done with school is another question. But um, I'm, I think it's doing pretty darn well. And yeah, yeah, it's 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 doing well. So let me ask about you. Why do you love jazz? I don't know. It's a compulsion. It's kind of beyond me. I don't really have a choice. I don't think I ever really found a moment where I was like, wow, now I love jazz. I'll write this down. Um, it, uh, I have a, I had a teacher two years ago, a guy named Jean-Michel Silk, phenomenal pianist. Um, he's from France. He spent a bunch of time in New York. He's at McGill now. Um, and someone, someone asked him, well, what do you play? Um, <laughs> and, and he said, I really don't have a, a say in the matter. It just comes to me. I have to get it out. I don't hear anything else. It's, you know, we get to improvise, but really I think kind of at its core, we're, we don't have a choice in the matter. And that I appreciate a lot. I appreciate that I trust the music so much that I can just let it take me away. Um, I appreciate that it's so human that it can just wriggle its way into my soul with ease. Yeah, I love it because it feels so good. <laughs> yeah. It just feels so good to listen to and to play, and my God, I must just be built for it. Yeah, that's right, man, for sure. So if you could get into a time machine, talking about live shows, actually this is kind of a two-pronged question. What is probably one of the most influential mm. influential jazz shows you've ever seen in person? And if you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see a jazz show, where would you go? Oh, man. Uh, I think one of the most influential shows I've ever seen, at least in recent memory, um, I saw 
two guys from the Twin Cities named Jeremy Ilvesacker and Michael Lewis this past summer. Um, they're also in a band called Alpha Consumer with the drummer JT Bates. Um, three minutes into the show starting, um, I was just weeping on some some lady's shoe, um, and uh, they just blew me out of the water. They, there's this phenomenal restaurant in St. Paul called Kyber Pass. It's just a teeny little Afghan restaurant, but um, they have some of the heaviest, most cutting-edge, um, beautiful music you could ever imagine hearing there. Five dollars to get in. Um, it's it's really something special. And as far as the time machine goes, I think I'd really like to go back and hear Bix Spiderbeck and Louis Armstrong play together because they're great friends. Um, but they never got to record because, well, frankly, because of racism. But they played together a lot. They were impassioned about the same. Th- things and so it's not quite a concert but you know if I could just kind of peer in the living room window while those two hang out on a Tuesday night that would that would really be something hopefully I don't get caught (laughs) yeah right exactly exactly very cool so let me ask you this everyone has a version of of who you all are as a band as an organism as a active jazz group your family your friends everybody that sees you live but who do you think you guys are as an act? When you get off stage, when you're prepping for a show, you're in the studio, who, who is this band? I can only, I really don't want to speak for them. What I really try to bring through this whole thing is a sense of humor. I think modern jazz, or at least going to jazz school and growing up in the kind of um, plantation institution model, um, it's people it's taken really seriously people have a lot of ego and a lot of anxiety wrapped up in making this music and other people consuming this music in um you know just making enough money off of it um and so i think what i like to do or at least what feels really good to me and that i think we've done successfully a few times is really trying to lift this kind of music out of that sort of worldly uh, consciousness, if you will, um, and really trying to make it a bit removed, a bit, you know, in a word, perhaps a slightly medicated away from reality. And so just to have fun, be funny, um, and to remember that this universe is, if nothing else, kind of fundamentally facetious. And I think we don't really, as people, we don't really have a choice but to deal with that and to accept it and to experience it to the best of our ability. So, you know, when I bring in a, a country song about a, a frog who lives in a pothole, I, I want to I loosen things up. <laughs> yeah. I want to loosen things up. I want to chill it out a bit, you know, because there's, there, there's absolutely a time and a place for being serious. I think we do that quite well. Um, I think we, we know what we're going for, but just having fun, man. You know, at the end of the day, that's what, it, what it's all about, in my opinion. Perfect. That's a great way, I think, to kind of wrap everything up and to put kind of an exclamation point on everything. Evan, thank you for taking the time out on behalf of the band and on your own life and music. Thanks for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, it's such an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Minneapolis, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Edmund for his time, his music, and his stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.